If the RMB were widely used in trade, I believe that it would actually make China a lot less recognitivistic than it currently is. Uh, again, another challenge that the world economy faces today is uh, the, the huge industrial overcapacity in China, which causes a lot of products to leak out to the financial markets, steel, chemicals, textiles, you name it, right? And if you think about it, how does this system come up? Right. This is about because China needs to import so much stuff. China needs to import a substantial amount of energy, right, especially oil and gas. China needs to import a lot of its foodstuffs, grains, meats, agricultural products, and also a lot of minerals. Now, in order to safeguard their national security, they have to export like crazy to stockpile dollars. Right. Why? Because they'll need those dollars to pay for their imports. The legal dollars are paid for their energy costs. But imagine if the revenue were widely accepted all around the world. If China could pay for whatever imports they wanted, just by printing energy, it would significantly lessen the pressure on China to export. Right? Because China wouldn't have to export to stockpile those dollars with which to pay for their imports. I also believe that international relations of RMB, right, broader access of RMB, would aid would accelerate China's shift to a consumer driven economy. Again, imagine if Chinese tourists could come to London, shop at breweries, could come to Paris, shop at Paris, could come to Bali uh, or Langhawi uh, and uh, pay for their souvenirs, pay for their shopping using Renmin. It would significantly encourage the Chinese to to, spend, to consume, right? Uh, which today is, is more difficult because uh, every country can do that as a Chinese tourist, as a Chinese consumer, you have to convert it to dollars. Broadly speaking, uh, you know, in, in, in monetary terms, terms I, I believe that as the world adapts to the international relations remedy, the remedy will become the, what I would call the fifth global pillar of liquidity. Right? Of course, the number one trade currency. Investment currency is dollar, right? Euro, yen, and pound sterling. Now, since the global financial crisis in 2008, those four central banks have been working very, very hard, printing money, and by doing so, providing liquidity to the world, right? The Fed, with its massive QE, the Bank of Japan, you know, actually this decade is their second decade doing this. Uh, they were doing it last decade. Uh, finally, the TV joined in. Uh, with massive quantitative easing. But conspicuously missing from all this monetary action is the central bank of the second largest economy in the world, China. China. So, so there's a gaping hole, in my view, view, in the world's liquidity system, system because China, China has not been acting as a provider of global liquidity. Right. Now, now why, why is this not happening? happening? Why is it so slow to be going? going you know? Well, of course, uh, a lot of it is inertia, habits. Uh, you know, the world is habituated to transact our trade in dollars, to invest our savings in dollars, quite a bit more you know, uh, open uh, to investing or trading in euros. Uh, even the yen uh, has a much smaller market share. Uh, but it's not a new world, right? Uh, back in 1999, we also all had to change our habit from using Deutsche, Deutsche Marks and uh, French franc and Italian lira, lira to you know, transitioning to using the euro. Um, and notwithstanding the challenges that the euro has had for the last few years, uh, I would argue that the euro is smashing success. You know, the, the monetary union of these dozens or so countries has created a much deeper, more liquid capital market. But right? it's forced a kind of convergence which, yes, from time to time, unavoidably will run into trouble. But definitely, in my mind, uh, there, there is such a thing as scale economies, even in currencies, right? Uh, now, the second thing is, uh, if you think about it, right, if the revenue were to be more broadly accepted all around the world, actually, what would have to happen, technically, and maybe my moderator, Manu Baskarara, can explain this better than me, but China would have to accumulate sizable reserves in each of our currencies. Right? China would have to 
a Cuban reserve is Rupiah, an Indian rupee, it's Saudi Rial, it's Russian ruble. Why? Because uh, uh, there'll, there'll be a natural consequence, consequence of each of us really our trade into sovereignty. Right. Right. With the, the way, way we work, work is uh, the people back in China would print the remedy and sacred reservation given to, to the Indonesian Central Bank. The Indonesian Central Bank would print the equivalent of Rupiah and give it to the BOC. Right. So both Central Bank reserves would rise as now, except the Indonesian Central Bank reserves would be added to the remedy and China Central Bank reserves would be added to Rupiah. Now, that's the thing, the next step that China will take uh, is just basically gaining comfort of accumulating valuable reserves in other currencies, right? Currencies of the major trade partners. And obviously, the, the, the biggest benefit, the biggest potential upside in doing this would come with those trade partners which are most affected by the shrinking dollar liquidity. So, I had breakfast with a former U.S. Treasury Secretary uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, actually, you know, we were discussing this concept, and they said, yeah, Tom, you're a You know, this is actually what's going to be happening. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, he shared with me that uh, he was actually around in the 1980s uh, when you know, USA uh, and Japan were negotiating the plaza support. And actually, the same logic at the time existed for the international relationship with Japanese Japan. Japan. Right. And, and basically, we've, we've done this before, before actually. Uh, you know, the yen uh, was in a very similar position to the RMB today. Uh, Japan, today. Uh, Japan in the 1970s, 80s, used to be before the yen. It became the second largest economy in the world. world. Uh, and, and yet, yet the international relations of the yen lagged far behind uh, the, the, the growth in the role of the Japanese economy. economy. So, so he shared with me that, that uh, actually, he was, he was surprised by how long it took to uh, internationalize again. Right. right. How long it took. Uh, nevertheless, he, he also acknowledged that uh, China is not Japan. Time for a different day. Uh, and uh, I think the technology is a globalization. I think uh, the infrastructure for uh, really nominating what our trade from dollars to remedy. It is much more advanced, much more digitized, much more electronic, and therefore, you know, arguably it can happen a lot more quickly. Now, lastly, of course, uh, it's, it's not simple, unfortunately. Uh, today, China is going through a difficult uh, economic transition, uh, and uh, speculators all over the world are watching very carefully. So obviously, the last thing that China wants to do is give a whole bunch of RMB to somebody. And for somebody that is just convert those RMB dollars, thereby putting a huge amount of pressure on the dollar RMB exchange rate. Right. So the last, the last piece of the puzzle, I would say, to make this happen uh, is to confine the international relations of RMB for the time being to trade. Right. So as we get in place, the mutual reserves, right, say Rupiah versus Rupiah, uh, say the Thai Baht versus Rupiah, uh, Saudi Arabia versus Rupiah. I think uh, it has to be fairly circumscribed, it has to be fairly limited, you know, for only trade purposes. Going back again to the Indonesia example, right, we, we import about 30 billion dollars per year of stuff from China every year. That's a lot of dollars that we also have to, have to keep generating from exports that for us to be more marketless, right, especially in the BBSA, uh, if we redenominated, really say, a third of that trade from dollars to revenue, it would save about $10 million a year of dollar demand, right, right. thereby there 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 lessening the pressure on the rupee dollar exchange trade. Uh, but again, uh, as China gives us those revenue, and if we return to give those rupee to China, right, we have to make sure that those revenue are used for trade, not for speculation. Again, yeah, if, if you know, know <laughs> in Indonesia, it's like we're waiting to reduce the economy to convert them to dollars. That's because I get the opposite of what we want right now. Uh, certainly, uh, with the disability that we've seen in the economy lately. Now, the second thing I thought I'd talk about uh, today uh, is completely different and fairly unrelated. Um, but I included it this, you know, what springs to mind or what. Resonates at the moment. Um, 
and maybe it's a bit eccentric uh, and, and unusual uh, to be coming from a trade industry. But actually, we don't want to talk about just morality. And uh, it's really a hard thing to talk about uh, without moralizing or sermonizing. But, you know, I, I tested this at the house uh, in January and I was molded to expand on it further at the law forum. Uh, and actually, uh, with apologies to those who attended the law and heard it from Curtis Community, those of you who were in the law who heard it from Curtis but uh, and, um, I'm being encouraged by more and more people attending the conflict to, to keep talking about it. So well, here I am, and I'm doing it. Look, I think, I think if we observe what's happening, uh, for example, with the US elections, right? right? If we observe the rise of demagogues and populists in Europe, right, in response to refugee crisis, terrorism, and the like, it's hard to get away from the issue that. We, all of us here, the elites, are at a significant risk of losing the public trust. I mean, really, you know, why are public around the world turning into demagogues or even worse, to experience or right? I think it's because uh, we, the establishment, are failing to generate the kind of trust that we need. And it's coming at a time when the world is going through so many fundamental and profound transitions. Uh, there's demographic transitions, there's economic transitions, such as China's going to production, and that's what led to consumption led. Uh, there's technological transitions, right? there's technological revolution. And then we, we, we all have to impose upon our constituencies unprecedented change. Now, when I, when I, when I mentioned this at Davos and at Boa, uh, you know, one response was, yeah, you know, you're right, Tom. Uh, at heart, a lot of the problems we're facing are ethical, you know, ethics. But I thought about it a bit more, and really, there's something deeper, isn't there? But ethics is about certain boundaries, you know, not being corrupt, not, not doing the wrong things, not, not breaking the law, and so on. I think there's there something missing that's deeper than that, right? right. And, and I think, think reflecting on, on the world, I'm actually surprised, surprised that the word morality doesn't come out more often in discussions like this, in you know, discussions like among the leaders. So to me, I think, think uh, morality is, uh, is, is what's about spirituality, uh, but, but in a very simple terms, term, it's, it's about kindness and wisdom. wisdom. Now, I just worry that without more kindness and wisdom, it's going to be difficult to fix the problems we have. We have to fix environmental, right? environmental uh, inequality. Uh, even if we fix them, if we don't tackle the roots, you know, our moral underpinnings will just create new ones. Right? And, uh, you know, for example, the notion that we can pollute with impunity, so to me, is a moral failing, right? right? It's not just an ethical failing, but there's, there's a moral failing there somewhere. Um, I think a uh, few examples of the power of kindness, uh, you know, like you use this, uh, you know, in, in Indonesia, uh, throughout the last few decades, actually, uh, you know, if you do a poll survey about the United States, what America, you know, America consistently gets very high ratings in Indonesia, something like 75 percent, 80 percent plus pro ratings. Now, those pro ratings plummeted uh, in the early 2000s after George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq, right? But then came the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, with the devastating the Indian Ocean area. And killing 150,000 people in Aceh province in northern part of Indonesia, and uh, the first people to see were the U.S. with the famous photo of the white hospital ship with the red cross sailing into uh, in Aceh, 
and uh, over, over the next few months, uh, there was a like spontaneous outpouring uh, by millions of people in the United States actually donating over the internet five dollar and ten dollar donations, and thereby raising something like six hundred thousand dollars for for and construction. And uh, America's global ratings in Asia went right back up, right. right. Um, and again, it was something that came from the heart. You know, it's something that came spontaneously from the American people, right? And uh, it's it's it was uh, an illustration to me of how I learned really now that in 50 or 60 years, America will still be a superpower. Why? Not because, because of the military hardware, but because, because of the kindness and generosity of the American people. I think you have to use a couple more, more uh, contemporary examples. examples. Uh, obviously, uh, the rise of Pope Francis, I think, again, his style, his focus has been very revolutionary uh, and inspiring. Uh, more practically, maybe, uh, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, the way he's welcomed Syrian refugees to Canada, uh, the way, you know, uh, his heart of support for women and children. Um, Certainly encourage everyone to, to Google it and then see uh, the videos of, of uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, welcoming the Syrian refugees uh, and Pope Francis, uh, you know, uh, washing, washing the feet of Muslim immigrants in Europe. And I challenge you not to be touched by it. Lee Kuan Yew, right? Uh, Singapore's legend. It was remarkable, I think, when he passed away, an uh, outpouring of love. Um, and uh, ironically, I personally actually use Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew as an example of humility. And a lot of people do a double take and say, Tom, humility, you know. I'm not sure that that's the first word that comes to mind uh, when I think about PMB. Uh, you know, maybe we want to solve the problem in the given world. What is actually true humility? No, the true humility is not grumbling or you know false modesty or whatever. I mean, true humility is like this, right? True humility would be your ability to admit that they're wrong, your ability to change your mind after decades of believing something. Right? To me, that's a true humility, and I believe that PLD did those, you know, more than once throughout his career. Uh, I believe that he was always strongly against gambling. But when time came for Singapore to build two casinos, he was willing to change his mind. He was willing to accept that time has changed. And perhaps, you know, his deeply held, long held belief was not more relevant. To me, that's true for humility. Um, but ultimately, I think that what Singapore longed for the best is why and why were people so. Emotional about the view, uh, and said it's very simple. He cared. He just cared. But he really, really cared, and in everything he did, he cared so deeply about the Singapore, about his people. Um, now, look, uh, personally, uh, I see the same in, uh, in President Jokowi of Indonesia, I see the same in Governor of Indonesia. It just happens to be that both of those two men are very religious. Uh, you know, like anyone else, they don't always have all the answers. But in my experience, they have a strong moral compass that leads them forward. Right? I think the direction generally tends to be right uh, very quickly, uh, even if the specific details still need to be pulled into place. I think if, for argument's sake, we agree that kindness is one of the more important things for us to talk about, morality is something fundamental that potentially is worth more surfacing in policy discussions or at least discussions among policy makers. You know, you know, what, 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 you know, what, how do we make it happen? How, how do we bring it about? I think, first of all, in this day and age, it has to be real, it has to be authentic. Right. Uh, I think I believe that populations around the world are savvier than ever before, especially the younger generation. 
uh, and, and now, now social, social media, media uh, you know, there's no such thing as secrets. Uh, I believe that if, uh, if they're, they're phony uh, or fake, uh, people, people can spot them a mile away, away. And, uh, and they will bully us uh, like, like crazy. crazy. Uh, it has to be beyond the superficial stuff, right? It cannot just be, we do our CSR, and then this is our job done. When it has to be deeper, it has to be more genuine, it has to come from the heart. The second thing I think is, I believe that the answer lies within, I think the answer lies within each of us individually, right? Um, and I believe that it's as simple as making a conscious decision at the time. It's as simple as, it's potentially as simple as making a conscious decision to be wise, right? I think all of us in the Middle East are very well educated you know, during our college uh, education, perhaps. You know, we, we have read plenty of literature and history. We, we know what it is to be kind. You know, we know what it is to be wise, right? Um, in our global exposures, we went through this critical of I think that uh, there's actually very good selfish reasons to be kind as well. Uh, I, mean, I think that it uh, you know, gives you an incredible rush. Uh, and, uh, and I think we still can be a little high. Uh, I know that this is, again, very eccentric, very unusual to be from an economic minister. Uh, but again, uh, talking to friends and family and, uh, and others uh, around the uh, forum circuit like this, uh, you know, I'm being encouraged to, to keep going with this. Um, I think, I think the alternative, alternative is we continue, continue to go around and around circles debating policy solutions. Potentially without us actually being genuinely, personally motivated to get them in place. We could continue to lose public trust, right? right? And, and frankly, by implication, we would potentially continue to feed the beast, right? The demagogues, populists, radicals, yes, the terrorists. They beat up the despair, the cynicism towards us, the elites, because, arguably, we elites are not kind, not wise, enough. Also, worrying that we're making our own job harder by talking about policies that are getting in too impersonal, too critical, too mathematical of a way. Right? I think we have to think of you, our policy discussions, we have to think of you, our policy statements with more humanity. You know, with more emotion. Uh, actually, we really believe that uh, our jobs could become significantly easier uh, if we uh, manage to speak, if we manage to, to lead with greater kindness and wisdom. Because again, I think uh, the more we really think about it, right, the more it is about public trust and then how to get it back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, again I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this very high power meeting and giving me this opportunity to speak. Let me be wise by not outstaying my welcome at the podium, and let me be kind by not inflicting any more on myself and you. So, with that, thank you very much.